That's not a comic book. Now that's a comic book. Hi everyone, welcome to a brand new show, because I don't have enough of those on this channel. I'm Sidfar2, joining me today is the Vacuminator. Say hello, Vac. Yo, what's going on YouTube? It's your boy, the Vacuminator. <laughs> <laughs> the whitest person on YouTube. Um, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> anyway, we're bringing it back. We're doing it. This is the third time I've tried this fucking show. Back. You're not gonna puss out on me. We're gonna make this happen, right? That that's the plan. Yeah, I, I am the plan with. Uh, I'm the man with a plan, not from Pakistan. Yes, indeed. So we are bringing back the monthly comic roundup again. I I love this format. This is a great idea for a show. I just need someone that can stick with me on reading comics, uh, if, if not week to week, month to month. So for those that don't know, here's the format of how the show will work. We, Vac and I are going to list our top book from every week of the previous month. So it's April, so we'll be talking about the month of March. We will list our favorite cover, an honorable mention, and the worst book of the month. And Vac had the idea to talk about some comic book news that uh, has been announced throughout yeah, the month. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a heavy news month. I mean, mm -hmm. man. Yep, yep. So we will have plenty, plenty to talk about. Looks like we got, ooh, five people here. Hello, five people, including Nathan Snyder in the chat. Um, hey, Nate. Sorry for the last minute announcement on doing this, guys. Was I, was I the one who announced it first? Yes, yes. I <laughs> I didn't want to uh, to announce it because there was a chance that it just would fall apart at the last minute here, and that would have been on me because I didn't realize that my wife and I would be going out of town uh, today. We left at like 9 or 10, or not even that, like 8 this morning, and um, just got back at like 8 this evening. So uh, just barely made it here for this. So I didn't want to... Uh, do too much announcement, but next month for uh, April's month, we'll uh, we'll have more of a preamble and and build up an announced date for people to show up if you're watching this after the fact. Anyway, I think that's plenty of preamble. We got five people here; they're excited to hear more talk about um, bringing back about comic books and and whatnot. I noticed my subscriber count has been going up the more comic book content I've been doing, so. I'm going to keep Very it rolling. Uh, monthly show is easy. Don't know if I have it in me for another weekly, folks. <laughs> anyway, uh, why don't you start us off back? What is your honorable mention for March? My honorable mention is Mighty Morphin Power Rangers number 25, the beginning of the big Shattered Grid event, which... Honestly, was a little overhyped in my opinion. This issue isn't amazing, but it's pretty solid. Um, you know, people, people. I, I listened to a bunch of podcasts of people reviewing this thing. They were talking about it like it was the greatest thing since Forever Red. It's it's more so just like an okay start. Like I, we've got good footing, but it's it's not exactly like oh my god yet. Um, even with that end reveal. Um, and I'm going to talk about that in a second. But basically the plot of this issue is that we start off with the Time Force Rangers in the future. This is supposedly taking place during the actual events of Time Force. It's not before the season or after it. It's, it's like right smack dab in the middle of it. Um, I don't even think Eric has become the Quantum Ranger yet in this comic timeline. Um, and they're dealing with this big disturbance in the morphing grid. Uh, Draken's gone, uh, Lord Draken has gone jumbo mode and just blown a hole in the side of the universe. And they're trying to close it up with the Megazord, and that doesn't work. So uh, Jen has to bail out at the last second and go and go all back to the future to try and stop Lord Dracon from creating this hole in the universe. We jump back, and it's mostly like follow up on stuff that happened up in the last issue with the MMPR teens. That's the bulk of this issue is actually just kind of the MMPR teens going. Um, yeah. So this happened in the prelude issue. That was pretty crazy, right? Uh, I'm Tommy Kimberly. You want to go see a movie? <laughs> and so they go see a movie and then there's this cute scene of Tommy walking Kimberly home. Um, but 
for some reason, the artist drew Tommy like he was just really pissed off the whole time. Like, he's got face the whole scene, and I'm like, what's going on with Tommy? But evidently, that's supposed to just be his general face. He's got resting bitch face. I guess so, even though he never had that in the show. Um, <laughs> and... Uh, this is this is like the beginning of their relationship in the comic timeline. So this is like the second date they've ever been on. And there's a moment towards the end of the scene where they almost kiss and Kim's like, you know, I went through some major shit with my last boyfriend. Um, that Go read Go Go Power Rangers if you want to hear about that. Literally, she says that. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, and uh, then... Uh, and she's like, I'm not, I'm not ready to go that far yet. You... And whatever. Okay, you got boundaries, girl. Tommy backs off. And so they go their separate ways. And then Kimberly's kind of talking to herself. She's like, man, that was stupid. I, I should have just kissed him. I should have just kissed him. And Tommy's like, wow, you went too far, bro. I can't believe you did that. She's going to think you're an ass now. And then they both have their moment of like, you know what? I'm going to run back and kiss him. And uh, right then, Lord Dracon appears out of nowhere, stabs Tommy in the back. Jen pops out of the future, starts shooting at Dracon. Dracon runs off, and the issue ends with Tommy apparently dead. Um, and that's that's kind of where we're left off for the beginning of Shattered Grid. Tommy is kind of the first casualty as far as actual Rangers are concerned. And, you know, I gotta applaud that as somebody who's so sick of Tommy. <laughs> um, but, uh... Overall, like I said, the bulk of this issue was just people standing around discussing stuff that happened in the last issue. So I can't exactly say it's like a huge moment, but it is good enough to get an honorable mention. And I'm still pretty hyped for, for Shattered Grid. And this issue is cool alone just for the fact of this is the first single issue I've ever purchased that was in a poly bag. This is a first for me. So hmm. that's neat. neat. Anyways, neat. that's my honorable mention. Yeah, see, I don't know anything about Power Rangers whatsoever. Um, <laughs> and so, like, every so, so often... I'm just, so your... for you, I'm just sitting over here going, wah, 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 well, not wah, 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 but, like, just every so often in nerd culture, like, you meet a fan base or you hear a fan base talking that you just know nothing about, and it's just, like, it's a fucking foreign language, dude. <laughs> um, but in the comments, Akuma Ranger says, I think the hype for Shattered Grid comes from the fact that the current television series is ranging from just terrible to just mediocre. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, Dino Charge was a solid season. The second season of it was kind of not so solid. And uh, Ninja Steel has been so mediocre that, I, that it's the first Power Rangers show I've actually dropped. I'm not actually watching Ninja Steel right now. Uh, for those of you who are watching it, I got five minutes into Ace in the Race, which is like the second episode after they came back from the hiatus. And I was like, I just can't. <laughs> nice, nice. No, but like it's it's good having you on here since you're on to you're into like franchises that I just don't give two fucks about. So Yeah. I mean that'll... if anybody here uh, in the chat doesn't know me, my entire channel is about Tokusatsu. So Yeah, cool, cool. All right. Uh, I'll go ahead and go on to my honorable mention, which is Darth Vader number 13. Um, you know, March, I realized it was probably like literally the worst time to ever do this because there were not a ton of good books in March. Like even the books that I like always adore, I thought, yeah, it was just okay. It's just our, an all right issue or it's, it's kind of like felt like a filler arc or something. Yeah, there um, definitely wasn't, like, a hard decision to be made for any spot this month. Mm -hmm. So, talking about Darth Vader, though, I usually think this book is is pretty bad. My ongoing joke that's not even a joke, it's just a completely valid criticism, is that it feels like a video game or cutscenes from a video game. And this is the first issue a year into it that's not felt like the case. There actually feels like there's hey. some, yeah, there feels like there's some driving story in this issue. There's some proper intrigue. It feels like something that Gillen would have wrote, written back in his Darth Vader run, which I love to death. That and that had that like whole duplicitous spy uh, movie kind of feel to it. And this has a lot of that going on. Um, I will give Soul credit, though, uh, because the one thing I have liked from him consistently is the way he's depicting Darth Vader's Force visions. And as me-worthy as this is, 
opening the issue with um with like Vader reliving the uh the fight on Mustafar and the whole don't try it, I have the high ground thing, but like imagine wait, wait, wait. that that scene is in this book. Well, it's like it's it's Vader force visioning it. Um, is, is the is the line in this book? That's what I gotta know. Oh, let's see here. Yes, do, it's over, Anakin. I have the high ground. All right, I'm buying this next week at the shop. Yeah, yeah. So, just because that scene's in it. Yeah. Um. And so, like, he's imagining himself as like Vader proper now in the armor and everything. And instead of doing the jumpy flippies, he just picks up lava and throws it at obi-wan and obi-wan like tries to dodge it and that like gives vader the upper hand so i just love the idea that vader's like sitting there meditating and we're like years away from the events of this now and he's just completely focused on this one failure in his life that has yeah. like completely changed the direction of his life that's, that's really good cool. he's having right? one of those moments you have where you've gotten an argument with somebody and then like 10 minutes later you're like Oh, damn it! They should have said I should have said this, and if and if they had said that, I would have said this. I just why did I only come up with this now? Yep, yep. Um, That's and then great. it gets into like you know Tarkin gets a cameo. We get Radis in this book. So there's some cool like, um, not even EU at this point. Actual uh, movie references and stuff. And then there's of course extended universe stuff with some references to the Inquisitors with Rebels, and that's kind of cool. Um, but yeah, it's just. You know, Vader hunting Jedi, pretty much the most stereotypical plot you can do with the Vader at this point, but it's working a lot better for me. Um, so if the book continues in this direction, I'd be very pleased. Uh, there were other books I could have easily put above this as an honorable mention, but I wanted to to give some credit where, where it's due and say, hey, Charles Soule, more, more of this, please. And I mean, like, from what I've heard of that book, it's it's kind of understandable that it's as mediocre as it can be because Disney's trying to keep their options for doing a Vader solo movie open. If and, they do a Vader solo movie, just adapt Killen's run. Yeah. Or Gillen's run. And I mean, like, movie. also, Soul, Soul's too busy doing, like, a great Daredevil run. So does he really need to be doing a great Darth Vader run? I mean... For me, that argument kind of goes out the window when they stopped Gillen's run because the sales were too low, and then within a year started a new Darth Vader book. <laughs> yeah, they they the one they the sales weren't low; they just wanted that number one money. I guess. All right. Uh, what is the pick for you for the week of March seventh? Uh, you know, it's kind of an odd choice for me. Um just for the reason I did pick it, but it's got to be Batman number 42. Um, I've, you know, I've been going back and forth really heavy on the whole Batman-Catwoman marriage thing, um, but this issue sold me on them as a couple because they are just being the most sarcastic motherfuckers in the world, this whole issue, and I love it. It's like if somebody took one of those Tumblr accounts that's like, incorrect um insert group of characters here quotes oh or like um, the superhero text message conversations yeah this is like one of those tumblers as an actual comic book and <laughs> um you know i'm usually annoyed by that kind of writing but you gotta give it to tom king he made that shit hilarious i the scene where selena is just going like Oh, Ivy could do this at my wedding, and Ivy could do this. I, I, I was on the floor yeah. when, I, when I read this. Um, and I, I read my comics at work when there's a lull. So just picture me on the floor of a gas station going, Oh, Selena, you kill me. <laughs> <laughs> that was me reading this issue. Uh, this, this was lots of fun. And... Uh, you know, I think the other two issues in this arc were a little on the weak side as far as King's Run is concerned, but this was this was really great. Uh, so that's why this is my pick for that. Yeah, Mike Mikael Janin's doing some great work on that are on that arc too, um, and I really like that. It's just for me, you know, I'm used to Tom King completely blowing me away, and I've quite enjoyed the Ivy arc and think it's a really uh, strong uh, take on the character as far as you know, dealing with the, the duplicitous nature of Ivy. Um, but I don't know, just something else that week kind of did it a little bit more for me. Hmm. All right. Um, well, what was that? 
That's Batman White Knight number six. I've been so back and forth on this book, and I really don't know if I should trust Sean Gordon Murphy, particularly after the um, the heinous acts of Nick Spencer uh, doing something very similar um, to a beloved character. So I've been really, really, uh, you know, a lot of trepidation on this book, but man, this issue did some really great things with Joker and Batman's duality that I really liked. That, that kind of solidifies that Joker's, at least in my mind, it solidifies the Joker has a point, but he's still playing a game. Um, and just, God, the the fact, getting to see this as kind of an anti-Dark Knight Returns is just really cool. And and the stakes are getting higher and higher. And, and as things go right for the Joker, they start to go wrong for him because he can't, um, he can't keep all the, uh, the, balls in the air and he's he's having a lot of trouble with it and so like spoilers that's the issue with the big car chase right yep yep all right so spoilers on this but it has one of the best endings that this book could have had by having jack turn into the joker again that was just a really really solid cliffhanger and yeah, it makes that- me want to read the next issue if we were doing like best cliffhanger of the month, I think that would have been my pick because that was just like that's the first time a Batman comic has given me a real pants to be darkened moment in like ten years. Mm. Yeah, um, and so Sean Nerd Murphy doing the art and the writing on this. I mean, he loved the Batmobile that he designed, and then he kind of fanboys out a little bit by throwing in the Burton Batmobile to. Um, that was just really cool. It's 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 stupid fun and interesting political commentary. Though I have heard some people getting annoyed that the political commentary is kind of dropped off in this book. Um, I don't know. The something about just the the Joker dealing with this and then that kind of fading as he's um, gotten more of a a advantage over Batman has just worked for me. Uh, that, and I mean, I'm sure the, the Joker fangirls out there were probably losing their shit over, uh, Jack without his shirt on. Uh, Jack is jacked, man. Um, so just lots of, lots of cool, lots of fun stuff going on in this issue. I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Seeing the Joker beat the shit out of Batman is actually kind of refreshing for me. Um, and then this panel here of Joker carrying Batman just really worked for me. Uh, just a lot of cool stuff going on here by comparison that I'm just not used to. And Sean Gordon Murphy also continues to make the um, the plot from Batman and Robin good. And that's just <laughs> <laughs> like working for me on some level. Uh, I feel like Sean Gordon Murphy is... I know this isn't true, but it feels like Sean Gerd Murphy has never read a Batman comic. He's only seen the movies and television shows. And he's just kind of making that all the, the universe for his comics. Um, and it's it's working in a weird way. So I don't know. That's I, not the case, though. It's not the I, case. I really read that book, and I, th- I think it kind of comes off to me just like Sean Gordon Murphy going, this is all the Batman media I was exposed to as a kid, and I thought it was all the same thing. So I'm going to see if I can actually make it all the same thing. Like, mm-hmm. that's what the book feels like to me. And I do enjoy that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, someone was asking, uh, Boingo Writer was asking, they still doing the three Jokers thing? Hey, my thing? boy Boingo's here. Cool, cool. I have no idea if they're still doing the three Jokers thing. I've not read anything with that in mainline DC continuity, but uh, Batman White Knights in its own universe, pocket dimension, blah, 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 continuity. Um, nothing to do with mainline DC. The King Run hasn't brought it up at all, to my knowledge. So if it is still a thing, I think the only place they're acknowledging it would probably be Doomsday Clock. But I'm not reading Doomsday Clock. Yep, yeah, That's all, like, someone asked Tom King about it, and he's like, that's Jeff John's story. And that's, I think, the polite way of saying, I have no idea what that shit is. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Vac, what do you got for us next for the week of March 14th. My pick for that week is uh, something that, you know, I normally wouldn't pick a book for this reason because I try to just go with what is the, to my critical eye best, but as a fanboy, I just had to pick Supergirl number 19. Now, I've mentioned in a bunch of places 
that Supergirl is my favorite fictional character of all time. And I do plan to one day do like a big analytical diatribe lecture on why that is, because it's quite the complicated, involved story. Uh, but this issue really hit home for me because of one of the major reasons uh, Supergirl is my favorite character, which is that when I was a kid and I found out about the character, just the mere idea of her existence helped me through a very heavy bout of depression I had when I was a kid. And a very similar sort of thing happens in this story. This is a this is a done in one, and it's about um, a uh, non. I believe I believe the term is non-binary. I apologize if I'm getting it wrong, but a non-binary person. Um, sort of coming to terms with the fact that they are non-binary and uh, dealing with a lot of bullying at school, not being sure on how to come out to their parents. And they just randomly meet Supergirl during an event that happened earlier in this book. And uh, through that, they kind of become friends and Supergirl is kind of like moral support for her during, or the person, excuse me, during this difficult time in their life. And... Uh, that, that really struck home for me, and it was really great, especially because I've not been a fan of the Rebirth run. Like, in my opinion, it's been really crappy, but uh, the last issue was pretty okay, and then this one was just, like, an absolute uh, right, right in the gut for me. Um, so I think this book might be on an upswing now. I don't know. We'll see how the next issue goes because that's the beginning of a new big arc. Um, but yeah, Supergirl 19, really great done in one. If you've never read the character before, if you don't get why people like Supergirl, um, like if you're one of those people that all you've read of her is her death in Crisis on Infinite Earths, go pick this up. It's pretty great. Hmm. Sounds good. I, I, if, I love one and duns. I don't think we do enough of them in uh, modern day comics, so I'll probably go pick that up just on principle. Uh, I saw in the live comments, Kuma Ranger says, is Supergirl still being hounded by the DEO, or are you not keeping up with a lot of the rebirth? Uh, yeah, that is that is still happening in this book. Um, that's actually the reason this story happens, is uh, the the sort of framing device is it's is the non-binary person is giving an interview to uh, somebody who works at CatCo, um, because right now the Supergirl book has kind of been forced into that weird place Green Arrow was a few years ago, where it's like, the TV show's popular, so try and have all the things the TV show has. Mm -hmm. um, so this person who works at CatCo um, and is a fan of Supergirl is like trying to find good positive stories about her because she's public enemy number one right now because um, evil racist Skeletor has taken over the DEO. I know he has an actual name. I know he's a character from the past of the DC universe, but to me, he's just racist Skeletor. Um, <laughs> I've never read him before. Um, so, so this reporter is interviewing this non-binary person because they found uh, their their story about Supergirl on the Catco forums, and they're like, "Hey, let me interview you. I'll make this an actual story in the newspaper." Dude, you just said evil racist Skeletor, and that sounds like it is such a meme-worthy kind of concept. Yeah. And just imagine like a particular like image of Skeletor and like some racist comment followed by meh. Exactly. <laughs> that that's exactly what this character is. If he, if the book wasn't taking him so seriously, he would be a cartoon character. Nice, nice. Okay. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and go on to uh my pick for March 14th, and it should surprise no one that it is Mr. Miracle. Number seven, uh, Tom King is absolutely killing it on this book. I've said again and again that I think um, this book is going to be the like Watchmen or Dark Knight Returns um, in that it's going to be a 12-issue volume that's all collected in one, and you're pretty much going to get it, be able to get it anywhere, not just comic book stores, not just main um you know large publishers that carry a line of graphic novels i think you'll be able to get this at like college bookstores i think this will be the kind of thing people are writing papers on for years and this issue in particular i liked quite a bit because it does so much to um counter a lot of the themes of depression uh that have been building up 
throughout this book. We've had, you know, I mean, the first issue opened with Scott slitting his own wrist, for Christ's sake. Um, and this issue really puts you in an, a, a very anxious state as they very, very intensely threaten the life of um, Scott's child twice, uh, his, his just newborn child, um, once while it's it's in the process of being um, delivered and once literally as it's just come out of Barda. Um, and so this, this just uh, was a really, really solid issue because they threaten it and with how dark a direction things have taken on this book, you really get nervous that Tom King was about to kill a baby. Uh, and he didn't do that. Uh, also, Mitch Gerards did a ton of, um, I, like, this almost deserves a, a writing credit for Mitch Gerards because there's he's just had a kid himself. This book was put on delay for a couple of months. Um, and someone asked Tom on Twitter about a plot device that's used here, which is the baby's heart monitor, uh, which is, you know, they, they hook a device up so that they can get a read on the mother's heart rate and also the baby's heart rate. Um, here they they have the baby's heart rate going throughout the whole issue. And at one point it stops and Scott and Barda just get really, really freaked out and uncomfortable, but they're both just saying, it'll be fine. Everything's fine. Not, this isn't going to be a problem. It's just something, um, you know, it's just, it's just a, a normal everyday thing. They'll be in here. They'll hook the heart rate monitor back up. It'll be fine. And it is. But on those pages where you're waiting for everything to be fine again, it is terrifying. Um, so this is just a really, really great issue to get the uh, the female furies in here um, and kind of show the absurdity of war is pretty fun. Um, I mean, uh, this whole series has sounded really great to me. Um, I definitely can't wait to read it. But by the time I got I got back into reading regularly, it was already like five or six issues in. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, I'm not all that up on it, but whenever I hear like people like you talk about it, I'm always like, damn, I, I, gotta, get, I gotta get that trade. I gotta get that trade. Yeah. Um, and, and they're holding off until they get a 12, uh, issue collection. So you're not going to get a trade until the, the full thing is out. Um, well, I almost prefer that. So yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. And for me, I'm going to wait till we get a deluxe edition because I just know it's going to be there. Apparently in the director's cut for issue one, they they added a uh, a short scene to like catch people up on what the new gods are. Oh, and I didn't know that. Otherwise, I would have bought the director's cut. I thought it was just the issue with Tom's script. Um, um, Akuma Ranger in the chat is asking what our opinion is on... Harley trying to become a member of the female Furies in her solo series that's going on right now. And honestly, whenever I hear anything about the, the Harley solo series that's been going on since 52, I think, um, my response is just, that's not real. Yeah. You can't prove that that's real. That's not actually happening. Yeah, I don't know. I don't. I try not to uh, read the Harley Quinn book. I've never liked how Harley's been written in the comics. Um, the the one comic issue that I always point people to of like this is how you write Harley Quinn is Joker's Asylum Harley Quinn. Mm -hmm. um, well, and uh, if an, if anybody is interested in reading Batman White Knight, like that's the, mm -hmm. I think the second issue of that is the one where we find out what's going on with Harley. Um, that's that's been pretty good too that's like just a dissertation on what harley is like right now and why that's completely fucking stupid yeah yeah um boingo writer uh said or is it boingo yeah i'm gonna go with boingo uh says how much new god stuff do you need to know going into mr miracle and honestly I don't think that much, just like the general thing that everyone knows, uh, the, that dark side's evil, high father's good. Um, and then there's the particular that Scott free was given to dark side to raise and Orion was given to high father to raise as a peace treaty. And Scott escaped because he's the super escape artist. Uh, he married Barda. Also dark side is dark side is. Hashtag dark side is, um, yeah. So there's there's not really a ton to know about it. I don't think uh, it's it's a pretty um, 
self-explanatory series. He's not pulling deep stuff from like Jack Kirby's fourth world, fourth world omnibus or anything like that. Though you should probably read Jack Kirby's fourth world too. It's, 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 mm. If you say so. Uh, <laughs> Akuma Ranger also says at the end of the series, I want there to be a comment on Scott to be, here stands Mr. Miracle, the one free man of Apocalypse. Ooh, that's good. Oh, that's good. puns. Yeah, yeah. All right. What, uh, Vac, is your pick for March 21st? My pick for that week is uh, Miss Marvel number 28. I believe this is the finale of the current arc that's been going for like six issues now uh, called Teenage Wasteland, where basically – um, Kamala got really overrun and overwhelmed with everything that was going on in her life, and she just bugged out. She just kind of had a, I, I'm done. I'm going to step out. I'm not even going to tell anyone where I'm going. Um, my family will, of course, know, but they're under strict orders not to let anybody know. Um, and in this issue, um, we, everything's kind of come to a head from that because her friends – we're going off and trying to fill in for her as Miss Marvel while also trying to find her. We've had the Red Dagger hanging around, which is a hero from back in her home country. And I forget which Muslim country she comes from, so I'm not going to take a step it's, in the dark Islamic. and say it in a – It's Islam? Yeah, uh, it'd be Islamic country, okay. not Muslim Okay, country. I'm just making sure – because I didn't want to say, like, Pakistan or something and somebody would be like, It's Islam, you insensitive fuck! <laughs> um but uh yeah the red dagger oh, okay is, is, mystical is, greenie beanie says she is from pakistan oh well there we go um but uh yeah the red dagger is a hero she met when she went on vacation to pakistan and he's now followed her home because of an exchange student program and also they've discovered a plot of the first villain that she fought in her book um, isn't actually dead like they thought, and he's trying to take over the world again. And without her around, her friends are kind of at a loss as to what to do, but they, they try to stop him anyway. It blew up in the last issue, and they ended up using her um, emergency communicator to Captain Marvel to summon Carol Danvers, and now sh she's here, as you can see in the cover of the issue, um, and she's basically leading the charge against this villain, while one of her friends is actually finally figuring out where Kamala is. And um, he has this really great little scene with her when he finally finds her and convinces her to come back. Um, and, and it's kind of this moment where she realizes, um, I was really overwhelmed with everything, but I never stopped to ask for help. And now that I'm gone, everyone is jumping in to help because they would have if I had just asked. And I, I, I was just too sh short-sighted to see that. And the whole, the whole kind of point of this issue is just if you're feeling overwhelmed with your life, don't be afraid to ask for help. Like the narration basically comes out and says that at the end. Um, because Kamala does, of course, come back after she hears what's going on. That that the I, the inventor, I believe, is what the villain is called. Um, I, this is from a week ago. I don't remember everything exactly. Um, but uh, she goes and she goes as Miss Marvel to stop the inventor. And after they defeat him, um, her and Carol kind of have this moment where it's like, um, haven't talked in a while. Yeah sorry about that i thought maybe you hated me because i i didn't agree with you during civil war ii nah i could never hate you you're great you want to go get ice cream after this yeah i i could use someone to talk to let's do that That's and sweet. it's 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 just this it's it's a really sweet little issue that sent a a message um i i actually really needed because of all all the crazy stuff that's going on in my life right now um so yeah miss marvel number 28 it's my pick for the month for nice that week. <laughs> nice uh yeah it's um i've heard a lot of great things about the book i've just never gotten around to it because i i don't have i've never read anything uh captain marvel uh related from marvel books uh i 
didn't even read Civil War II because who else did? <laughs> um, I need to help my uh, my dad with something for just like two minutes. Go ahead and do your pick. I'll probably be back before you're done. Okay, sounds good. All right. My pick for the 21st is Super Sons, number 14. Oh, oh, I love this book so much. And I hate every one of you that, that wasn't reading it because this book is is being canned and it's it's on its final issues. And I'm sad because it was a really good book. Uh, I love Damian Wayne. Uh, Jonathan Kent is a great new character from Rebirth. And the idea of putting them on a book together, them hanging out and and being kind of begrudging friends on Damien's part, at least, is just adorable to me. So I, I absolutely adore this book. Um, and then just the way in which the issue progresses with, with Lois Lane about to be murdered by Talia al Ghul, that's just really fun to see the boys try to foil that plot. And it's also really great to see Damien, you know, confronting his mother. I, I really like to see Damien um, having these righteous moments of, of telling Talia that she's wrong. Wait, and are, that, is your pick Super Sons? I just got back. Yes, yes, it is. I called it! <laughs> yep. I love this book, dude. It's too good. It's too well, good. It's I too knew good. that specifically you would pick this issue because of how much you always talk about that Damien Talia moment from the Morrison run where he where he doesn't uh, agree to stay with the league. Yep, that's one of Damien's best moments. Um, and he gets kind of a repeat of that here, and that's just really cool. He also gets to, like, best his mother, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, I, I really, really enjoyed this issue. Uh, it's interesting. We're actually keeping the same costume that Joelle Jones drew Talia in um, back in uh, the, um, uh, what was the Batman arc with uh, Rules of Engagement. Um, we're, we're I keeping that's that same just outfit. her canon costume. Yeah, I guess it's just the, the outfit she's wearing now. Uh, this issue also gets points for the cover having literally nothing whatsoever to do with what happens in the book. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I haven't seen that in quite a while, but you got you got to love those clickbait covers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I don't know, it's just adorable to see John and, and Damien hanging out and them dealing with this and just... You know, the power of their friendship kind of overcoming Talia's, like, venomous tongue. Um, so that's just really, really enjoyable. And then they get just this absolutely adorable moment at the very end. It's too much fun. This book is too good for you people. That's what it is. <sighs> uh, yeah, see, that, that was my runner-up for that week. If Miss Marvel had not hit me in such an emotional place that I, I'm giving me a message I actually really needed to hear... Um, I probably would have picked that. Yeah, yeah. Um, Mystical Greeny Beanie says, it's getting canned not because of low sales, but because Bendis is doing something big with John in his run. You could have had both. You easily could have had both, DC. Yeah. Oh, and guys, don't forget, Bendis is coming. Yep, yep. Uh, I, I want, says, I Ian, just... Does that Super Sons book have the Bendis is coming ad? Dude, everything has the Bendis is coming ad. Yo, legit, the um, I think the the Man of Steel is that this week or next week? You know, I don't know. Uh, I know. I, I thought his first premiere issue was gonna be Action One Thousand. Uh, I I think it is too. But but whenever Bendis actually comes that Wednesday, I'm gonna walk to the comic store just going like Paul Revere. Bendis is coming. Bendis is coming. Bendis is coming. <laughs> <laughs> nice, nice. All right, Vac, what do you got for the 28th? For the 28th, I picked um, because as it tends to do, at the end of the month, Saga came out of nowhere and gave me probably one of the most beautiful comics I've read in a long time, Saga number 50. This is probably the best anniversary installment of anything i've ever read like it's it's so subtle yet every aspect of it is about like a big milestone moment in the characters lives or just discussing milestone moments and where things are about to go and where they've come from and uh you know this 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 issue actually starts off with uh marco and alana 
um, celebrating, um, according to the narration, the the only anniversary they ever actually get to celebrate is in this issue. And uh, despite it being one of those moments where you open the book and go, oh, I shouldn't be reading this in public, it's actually really sweet. Aww. And uh, I, I liked it a lot. And um, it... It was just it was just kind of one of those moments where I read it and I and I went this this can't not be comic of the week. This is just fantastic. And just look at this cover. How often do you get this in a book like Saga? Just a just a nice wholesome cover of the two main characters and their kid just posing for a family photo. It's great. Hmm. I love it. Nice. Nice. Um, yeah, that's a book like I think I've seen on the the stands every so often, but I don't think um, I don't think I've ever read. I don't even know anything about it, honestly. Um, have Have you read Why the Last Man? Nope. Um, I, this was the first Brian K. Vaughn thing I read, but I would really recommend reading Why the Last Man first because it's kind of like a proto version of this. But then definitely go and read this because this is this has been phenomenal. Like this is like you were talking about with Mr. Miracle. This is um, highly likely to go down in history as just one of the greatest creator owned books of all time. Mm. Um, it's it's every, every couple of issues. There's a moment where I'm like, this is I'm reading a modern masterpiece in the making. What the hell? Nice. nice. Yeah. All right, I'm going to go ahead and go on to my pick for the 28th, and that is Batman Beyond, number 18, written by Dan Jurgens with art by Phil Hester. Um, so this is just like, again, March wasn't a huge, strong week for a lot of books. A lot of the stuff I'm picking I thought was like pretty all right, all things considered. It sounds like you had a much better week than I, or month than I did. Um, like... I've really enjoyed the new 50 or the, the rebirth Batman beyond book, which is really saying something because of how much I hated the, the final new 52 Batman beyond book. Um, but man, does Dan Jurgens know how to drag some shit out? Like, yeah, he's kind of the master of that from what I've read of him. Yeah. Like, okay. So let's, this is cover gets points for actually having to do with what happens in the issue. So Dan Jurgens for like the last two and a half arcs has been seeing the idea that we're going to get Robin beyond and it's going to be Matt Terry's younger brother. And I am down for that. That's a great idea. Yay. Finally, we're, we're expanding the Batman beyond mythos. We're making it, you know, a bigger thing. We're really establishing that Terry is Batman and not another Robin, which is great. Um, I, I love all that. But Jesus fucking Christ, three story arcs to get to this one point where he's just like, okay, I'll be Robin now. <laughs> Come the fuck on with it. <laughs> um, so like, and, and like we get a reveal and Jurgens is doing a bunch of stuff that like, I don't know, you watch Batman Beyond, I'm assuming. Do you remember the character Payback? Because I really don't. Um, he was like, Terry had, it was infamous for having a villain that would have one episode, right? Um, I'm, I'm thinking really hard, but legitimately, I, I'm like Gandalf right now. I have no memory of this place. Yeah. Okay. Payback. The the backstory for him was he was a kid who kind of like took over a um, exoskeleton to make himself look imposing like an adult. And he was committing murders because his father wasn't paying attention to him. Um, and so Batman busted him and, and he got sent to basically like youth prison kind of thing. Um, and then we never heard from him again until this story arc and he's back and they're like, but he should be in his twenties now. Why is he still hung up on what, what happened to him all those years ago? Um, and then you get the reveal that no, actually the kid was bullied mercilessly inside the prison and took the only way out he could think of, Ooh. which was to kill himself. And so the new payback is his father who had ignored him. And instead of accepting the blame that his actions caused his son to act recklessly and be put in this situation, he's putting all the blame on Batman. So I actually quite oh, like that. Shit. That's that's actually kind of cool. That's like a proper traditional Batman villain. Yeah, it really is. It's it's a great lead up and, and payback's actually a really competent villain. He's 
he's really got Terry on the rope several times at, at this point throughout this arc. And, and Terry just keeps escaping by the skin of his teeth, which I quite like that way of writing Terry, because let's just be honest, Terry is Batman if he were Spider-Man or Spider-Man <laughs> yeah. if he were Batman. Um, so just the, the, the different way of addressing that and dealing with that. And it just feels very Terry. It feels very Batman beyond. And it feels like a more dark twist that the comics can bring that the show wouldn't have been able to. And I also like that we have Bruce who still wants to be able to go out and help Terry like he did a couple times in the show, but because of injuries that he received, um, he, he's wheelchair bound and he can't, he can't even get up and walk across the bat cave. So that's why Matt is going out and, and Matt's apparently watched all these videos of, of so uh, wait, Bruce wait, training. Is, Damien. Is, is Bruce now the Oracle of the, the T Bruce Tim universe. I mean, kind of. That's what he was anyway at Batman Beyond. When you really think about it, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I don't know. This this just uh, this was a pretty good issue. Uh, I also like Robin's light cycle for you Tron fans out there. <laughs> <laughs> um, Boingo writer in the chat. Have they given? a real non-bullshit reason for why Batman Beyond has lips yet? Dude, I don't know. They they just got him back in the classic costume after doing an arc that introduced Damian Wayne into the Beyond universe, um, where Terry was in a an updated version of the Bat Beyond suit, um, and they didn't bother to explain why he has a movable mouth. It's aesthetically pleasing, that's why. <laughs> Zero fan production animators says, more to do. That's yeah, Zero Fan Production says, what did I miss? Almost the entire show. Congratulations. Hey, we haven't gotten the news yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So yeah, uh I just I'm liking that book. It's it's fun, uh, especially if you're a Batman Beyond fan. I, I quite enjoy it. Um I mean I really wanted to get up on the Batman Beyond stuff because I read the the Hush miniseries they did back when that stuff was getting started, and then I read the first couple issues of the proper ongoing, um, and that was like the first time I ever got into reading um, regular new comics. Uh, but then I fell off, and that that series got way ahead of me before I ever got back to reading the second time. I'm on my third time trying to read regular now. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, so I, I just, I, I just, I, I want to read that, but it's like, where's the time? Mm -hmm. No, dude. The, uh, the new fifth, like new fifth. All right. So you had, you had a Batman Beyond miniseries that got started in the old Fifty Two, mm -hmm. and then you had the ongoing that got started in the old Fifty Two, and then you had the ongoing that continued into the new Fifty Two. Um, and like, that was the golden age of Batman Beyond comics. Like that gets points for doing something kind of sort of that I always wanted. They go to the Justice Lords universe in the Beyond timeline. Oh shit. And Terry runs into himself, but he's a member of the Jokers. And like, that is just, that is my crack, man. <laughs> um, I mean, Justice Lords might actually be my favorite episode of the Bruce Timverse, so mm -hmm. I kind, I kind of, I kind of want to go read that right now. <laughs> oh, it's it's a really good arc. They did some great stuff in the in the New Fifty Two, but like the the final arc's just kind of okay. But that whole book is just amazing. Um, all right, so now we we take the the negative turn of the evening, and we're going to talk about our worst book from the month of March. Vec, what do you have as your worst issue from March? Okay, so my pick for worst of March is Factory, number one. Now, I did this weird experiment last month where I was like, I'm going to buy every new number one and see if I can find some cool stuff that I wouldn't have normally read. Um, and I did, I did find a few cool new things, um, mostly independent stuff. Uh, I'd highly recommend you guys check out the first issues of Lucy Dreaming and Infidel. Those are on my poll now. Uh, but um, this is incomprehensible bullshit. <laughs> 
<laughs> like literally this entire comic is just overly long dialogue that's nothing but weird sci-fi fantasy words that seem completely out of context. Like this seems like somebody's fan fiction for a larger property that I have never heard of before. Um, I, 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 I have no idea what happened in this. It's got a nice cover, but I, I have no idea what happened in it. And the actual art inside this book, I get the feeling it's supposed to be, but it is ugly as sin. Um, mm. So yeah, mm, factory number one. This is this is actual garbage. Don't read this. Damn, that's that's harsh. <laughs> um, <gasps> Yeah, techno babble can get very overwhelming very quickly, can it? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, for my worst, it's Mystic U book three. Uh, yeah, that was pretty weak sauce. I gotta admit, I have yeah. been reading Mystic U. I I had such high hopes when I saw this book was announced. I was like, oh, that sounds awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Hogwarts in the DC universe. Fuck yeah, I'm down. Yeah, and like Teenage Zatanna is one of my favorite niche dc things mm -hmm. like i don't think we do that enough but it's it's like my favorite thing in young justice yeah and this is just not this is the opposite of good um mm -hmm. it feels super rushed and sloppy and i talked about this in my review but like at one point zatanna dies in this issue early on in this issue zatanna is dead yeah and they they bring her back to life and so, but they're under the impression that she almost died. And then they immediately start talking to her once she's back. And someone goes, so you're still going to be able to work on that group project? And I'm like, there's just like this complete lack of emotional realism from Tact. this book. You don't have it. Yeah. There's just this complete lack of emotional realism. Like from issue one, Zatanna's father disappears into hell. And Zatanna goes to school. I'm like, she freaks out for like three panels and then and the teacher just, literally just goes, nah, dog, he's going to be fine. And yeah. that's all we hear about it. And everybody's like, okay, he'll be fine. Yeah, yeah. And so, like, just there's this just complete distance from the characters. And, and so nothing feels very real. And then things start to take a bigger turn. I might come around on this book when I read it, when it's all complete. But I doubt it right nah, now. Man, it is it, just, it's off my pole after this issue. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I can tell it's definitely being written to be read all at once, so maybe it'll improve in that way, but right now, I am just not pleased with this book at all. Like, I can't, I, in my uh, little review, because I do little mini, like, free sentence reviews on Goodreads for everything I read, um, in my review for this, I, I, the one compliment I gave this issue was um, I, I liked the scene where the two characters are discussing what it's like to be a necromancer mm. but like immediately after i posted that review i was like you know what that scene was pretty bog standard i don't i don't know if it's fair to say i liked that well what's even worse about it is it just like ends like you yeah. don't get any reflection on it it just there's no point to it it's just this person going so you're a necromancer i am too i know what that's like end mm -hmm. scene yep pretty much um, so yeah, I, I'm just not pleased with this at all. There's, this is just weak and that's unfortunate because this could be a, this is a fantastic idea for a book in literally anyone else's hands. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, let's go ahead and talk best cover of the month. What do you got back? Well, I don't think it's going to be a surprise to anybody, but it's, gotta be saga number 50 like i said this is just too good you almost never get this kind of cover nowadays just a nice wholesome image of your main characters um like screw big action pose group shots this is the kind of stuff i want as a poster mm -hmm. this is like if i walk into my comic shop in the next couple of weeks and see like a big blown up version of this for like 10 or 15 dollars as a poster i'm nabbing that this that this is just I look at this and it just makes me smile. It just it just makes me happy. Nice, nice. All right. Uh, for me, this this cover I almost wouldn't have gotten unless a very particular set of circumstances happened. But this is the cover for Batwoman number thirteen. I didn't love the twist ending for this issue, but goddamn, Lee Bermejo, Lee Bermejo and Batwoman. Oh God, this is beautiful. 
Um, I'm I'm kind of in love right now. Uh, this is just really really cool. Lee Bermejo has a great style. He of course did Lex Luthor, Man of Steel, and Joker, and Batman Noel. Um, and he's just a really really good artist. And this is a really really good variant cover. Um, the normal copies of Batwoman number thirteen for my shop were damaged, and so they just put their variants out at regular price. And nice. so I got this instead. Um, and so I wouldn't even have known this was a thing if not for happenstance. But man, am I glad that happenstance happenstanced because this is a beautiful cover. Yeah, I didn't even know there was a Batwoman ongoing now. I thought she was still crammed into Detective Comics. Uh, there is a Batwoman ongoing, and it's by my uh, my comic book writing bay, Margaret Bennett. Oh, neat. Yeah, she is killing it on that book, man. Um Still didn't love the twist ending of that one. That was, but the the issue was still pretty good overall. Um, all right, so that does it for the book portion of the monthly comic roundup. But back. Uh, what about us... best of the month? Oh shit! Yeah, yeah, right. That that's a thing that we do. <laughs> the entire point of the show. <laughs> right. Shit. Well, I'm not a host on YouTube. I'm just some dude in his fucking room. Um, all right, yeah, best best book of the month. I'll go ahead and go first just because uh, it's no surprise. It's Mr. Miracle number seven because it's amazing. And Tom King and Mitch Gerards are like the total bros of the comic book industry right now, just killing it on books. So got to love it. Yeah. My best of the month is, of course, no surprise, Saga number 50. I got I got to I got to hand it to Vaughn, man. I mean, I don't even normally like this book in single issues. This is like. I, I, I enjoy that I keep up with it, but I prefer to read it in like the trade format because it, it just works better when you get a ton of it at once. But this is just the best single issue of the thing um, since the first issue, and it stands on its own perfectly well as long as you just know the vague idea that these are char these are star-crossed lovers and they're fugitives. Um, if you just if you just know that, you could probably go into this and start reading from here. I wouldn't recommend it, but you could. <laughs> um, and uh, as somebody who's been reading since issue one, um, it it just it was I found it really beautiful. Um, so saga number fifty is my pick for best of the month. Nice, nice. All right, now, as I was saying, uh, <laughs> Vac, since I asked him to be on the show, I asked him if he had any ideas for it, and he suggested that we do some news pieces, talk about stuff that's been announced and, and the like, uh, and so he is in charge of that section, and I'm here to go, yes, cool. And I will be posting the links to the news stories in chat for anybody who wants to follow along, as well as sending them to you, Ian, in the Google Plus call. Sounds good. Um, so the first thing I have from all the way back at the beginning of last month doesn't even feel like it was from last month because we had so much news this month. But uh, what do you think of DC's new black label imprint? That I've heard about, and I'm excited for some of them, and others I'm like, why are you giving Superman to Frank Miller? What about that sounds <laughs> like a good idea. <laughs> yeah, um... Kelly Sue DeConnick on Wonder Woman, though. That, that is exciting news. I mean, I almost want to read the first issue of the Frank Miller thing just to see what the hell it's like. Um, but I, I don't know. There's not a whole lot about this that jumps out to me, aside from the fact of, hooray, DC finally understands we don't want quote-unquote edgy stuff in the main line. Um, but, uh, I don't know, the Batman book, it's, it's Azarello and Bermejo, so that could be pretty good. I don't um, necessarily trust Azarello with Batman, because I hate Joker. Hmm. Um, I haven't I'll read see. Joker, um, I, I, I just know that team from Batman Noel. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, no, actually, Noel's just Bermejo. Oh, um, I, I didn't know that. Yeah. They worked on, like I said earlier, it was uh, Lex Luthor, Man of Steel, Joker, um, and then Bermejo did Noel all by himself. Wow. Um, so you're thinking you might only pick up the Kelly Sue DeConnick Wonder Woman book? 
There was that one, and I was I was on the fence. I'll probably give the Batman book a try. Superman, very little interest. Um, isn't isn't King's uh, what did they what did he call that the the one where he wanted to deal with PTSD? Didn't that get looped into the Black Label? Um, I think that did, but I I it's not on my news list because it wasn't part of the original announcement. Um, mm -hmm. I only passingly heard about that. Um. But, I mean, it's Tom King, so I'll at least read the first issue. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so let, let's move on um, to something that's about to, about to start, a big story arc that's about to start. What do you think of this whole um, Damien becoming Slade's son thing? Uh, fuck you, who's ever doing that story, most likely. Probably not. I'll probably wait to see till you reveal that it's not actually the case. And if you do make it 100% actually the case, I hate it. I hate yeah. the idea. Don't do that. That's a bad idea. It's, it's really terrible. And it strikes me as a leftover idea from the new 52. Um, I'm just, I'm sitting here crossing my fingers going on. for anyone who doesn't know. Um, there's going to be a story arc crossing between, I believe, Detective Comics, one other Batman book, and the current Deathstroke ongoing, because there's a Deathstroke ongoing for some reason. Because for some reason, Deathstroke is a character DC's been trying to push really hard for the last few years. I still don't understand that. But there's going to be a story arc where um, somebody provides a DNA sample saying that Damian Wayne, the current Robin, who is Batman's actual literal son, is going is actually Deathstroke's literal son, even though Deathstroke has already been a character established as a father for years. This literally gives nothing to his character. It only takes away from Batman and Damien. So I don't know why they're doing it. I hate it. I'm hoping to God um, Tom King's run doesn't have to acknowledge it in any way. Me too. Me too, because... Just, God, that seems like such a bad idea. Because, all right, all right, even even if it is true, and it, it's, even if that's the case, it doesn't mean anything because Damien and Bruce have a, a very particular father-son relationship at this point yeah. um, that is distinct from the other Robins. And I don't think that, you know, making him not uh, Bruce's biological son will uh, will do anything to that. That being said, I still don't like the idea. It's still a bad idea. Yeah, I mean, honestly, as soon as the news broke, I, I just predicted, like, I, I will eat my hat if the story does not end either, oh, it's not actually Damien who's my son. It's this other character who's brand new and nobody will care about. Or Damien goes, so what if I'm his son? You've always been more of a fodder to me, Bruce, and nobody ever talks about it again. Yeah, yeah, that's that's what I'm thinking too. Terrible idea. <laughs> um, so moving on from terrible to potentially great, Gail Simone is writing a new Plastic Man ongoing. Um, are you interested in that at all? Um, it'll depend if they do a redesign on Plastic Man. Um. Because I think Plastic Man looks like a 70s porn star. Um, he definitely does. <laughs> but I mean, like, I know nothing about the character, so I'm excited about this as a potential introduction to him. I might pick up the first issue just to see what it's like, you know? One of those things. I might just give it a shot. Yeah. Um, so another new DC thing that's happening is there's going to be a new Hawkman ongoing spinning out of DC metal. Um, do you care about this at all? Like my thoughts on Hawkman consist of if, if you go watch the, uh, the Pete Holmes show where he did like these bits called X-Men where it was Professor X firing the X-Men because he was explaining why they were all useless. <laughs> and you just watch the Angel episode. That's pretty much my thoughts on Pla on Hawkman and Hawkgirl too. Mm -hmm. I find them pretty useless and and 
it always baffles me when they're in the Justice League because they just don't belong whatsoever, in my opinion. Um, and I'm sure that someone has a rich history and appreciation for the Hawks, but the fuck if I do. <laughs> See, like, I know literally nothing about Hawk Man, but I've always been a huge fan of Hawk Girl because I grew up on the DCAU. And she's like one of the biggest characters in their Justice League. But I've always gotten the impression that that version of her is nothing like what she is in the comics. So I want to read the first issue of this just to kind of finally figure out what those two are like in the comics. But I doubt if I'll read any more of it. Um, like that's that's just how how I feel about this book. Like Plastic Man, I could see myself maybe actually putting on my poll if it's good. Hawkman, it, that first issue is really going to have to impress me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just I have no interest in the Hawks. I don't even have interest in picking that up unless people ask me to. It's <laughs> uh, kind of where I'm at with that. I'm like, if you just want to see me sit there and make fun of Hawkman for like 20 minutes, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, Brian Hill is going to be taking over Detective Comics, I think this month, actually. And he's making Black Lightning a main character in that book. Are you interested in giving this run a shot at all? You know, I was really interested because I, I don't really care for the direction that book is going in right now. With I believe it's Tinian um, writing that. which is Oh, yeah, the Tinian stuff has been just so bland, honestly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I was, but I, I think he's only coming on for an arc. And, I mean, that could be like a six-issue arc or something. But... Um, I believe that writer's only coming on for an arc, so I'll definitely give that arc a shot. I'll probably check out the first issue of that whenever that's supposed to reveal. I imagine it'll probably have Black Lightning on the cover. I know the TV show's been pretty popular, so mm -hmm. it seems like it's creating kind of a interest in the character in the comics mm -hmm. and stuff. So I mean, cool. again, Black Lightning is someone I know nothing about, and Dude. honestly, his whole, like... His whole popularity right now, and I, I hate I hate to be this guy because I know how it sounds, especially considering the color of my skin, but it really feels like people are just trying to cash in on the current um, wave of black media whenever I see stuff like the black, um, the black Lightning show. I'm just like, that really just feels like you're just trying to cash in on the fact that Luke Cage and Black Panther are really popular right now. Yeah, uh, I think that's that's fair, and honestly, I don't care, because follow the damn trend if it's a good trend, and to be fair, I watched the first couple episodes of Black Lightning, and it's better than any of the other CW shows right now, in my opinion. Uh, well, I, I mean, I, that's not much of an achievement, but... It's not much okay. of an achievement, but it's it's miles better, let me put it that way. Oh, so, like, I watched the first couple episodes, and I thought that was pretty good. It, it dealt with, you know, the police brutality thing, uh, which was pretty cool to to be addressing directly. So, uh, the thing for me is, like, I know nothing about Black Lightning to the point where when I realized that Black Lightning and Static Shock are two separate characters, I was like, oh, wait, what? <laughs> I, I was okay, seriously... Okay, at least I knew that. <laughs> no, see, I, I'd always thought that, like, when they made Static Shock, they're just like, okay, we're gonna make a Black Lightning show, but we're gonna give him an actual superhero name as opposed to just like the Black character um, name. And so then when I found out Black Lightning was like his own separate character and, and existed with Static Shock, I was like, oh, well, that's weird. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, um, so I mean, like, I might give this a shot if I if I remember that it's happening that week. But uh, I don't know. I felt like I should just bring it up because it, 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 it is like a, a thing I've heard a few people talk about. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, getting on to kind of a bigger piece of news, what do you think of the two Scott Snyder Justice League books that are about to happen? What are they again? I know he's doing the main book. What else is he doing? Um, I believe he's doing Justice League and, like, um, uh, is it Justice League Dark? No, that's, um, that's, uh, that's Tinian. Um, okay. I believe it's Tinian. And I'm, then, I'm looking at the article right now. Uh, Justice League and Justice, that's what just ended. Um, I 
don't think this article actually says what the other title is. Um, that's irritating. Well, I know three Justice League books were announced. I don't know if Snyder's on two of them, but I know um, Snyder's on the main Justice League book, and I'm going to repeat the joke that I did last week when I was talking about this. I've already actually read Scott Snyder's Justice League, and I liked it better the first time. Um, this is Grant Morrison's Justice League. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, no, I'm not interested in Scott Snyder's Justice League, but the other two books, Justice League Dark and Justice League Odyssey. Um, Dark, I, I love the concept of just Wonder Woman leading the Justice League Dark team makes sense because she's got mythology as the background for why she has superpowers and stuff. And then um, Man Bat's on the team, so fuck yeah, he, he totally fits in like the whole werewolf, universal monster um, lineup of, of kind of horror characters, so that's totally fine with me. Uh, so I, I'm excited for the team, so I'll be reading that just based on the team. And then Justice League Odyssey, I'm also excited for the team because Dark Side on the Justice League sounds like some Silver Age craziness. Yeah. I'm down for it, but it's I, also I, got. I kind of, I, I kind of have to read Odyssey just for that. Yeah, but it's also got Steven Sejic doing the, um, the art for the book, and I really, really love Steven Sejic's art as well as his storytelling ability. Uh, you know, if you really want some hot lesbian bondage comics, go read Sunstone. But um, <laughs> 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 like he does, he does really great art, and he's a really good storyteller. And I know he has a pitch in with DC, so I'm really hoping that. If a lot of people go read books that he's on, DC will give well, him a book. It's like whatever. a modern success story because he got big off of people just retweeting his deviant art. Mm -hmm, basically, um, so I really hope that like people go read his stuff. DC gives him a book, and eventually we get Stephen Cedric doing a Harley Quinn, like either graphic novel or, or miniseries or something. Because imagine he has if he's the, the guy who brings Harley Quinn. real Harley back to the DCU. Mm hmm. Oh. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great because he's got a fantastic voice for Harley Quinn. Uh, if you want some really great Harley Quinn comics, go to uh, Steven Sejic's DeviantArt, which is, I think, Nebenezel, uh, however you spell that, um, and look up his Harleen series where he just did – just as – like, the dude has just oozing it's fan talent. fan fiction, but it's, like, the best fan fiction you've ever read in your life. Yeah, he just oozes talent. He's like, I just want to experiment with black and white and with some really short storytelling ideas. And he does like four strips, and they're just genius. And they're like, they're like, you know, the length of of kind of a plus size comic when you put them all together. Um, and it's just different scenes with Harley Quinn. And it's genius. Um, quite, um, quite like what he does with Harley. So. Yeah, I mean, I'll give I'll give these a shot. Um, I I'm not a big Scott Snyder guy, but um, I, I'm interested enough in them that that I definitely want to grab both those first issues. And who knows, maybe this could be the book that gets me into Scott Snyder. But mm -hmm. let me know how that goes for you. <laughs> um, I, my lesson with Scott Snyder is just don't say anything because that did not go well for me. Um, but I just, I just don't like his, his voice for Batman and it has very little, uh, it's done very little to inspire me to pick up anything else by Scott Snyder. All right. Um, well, Marvel Fresh Start is, uh, starting next month. So Newsarama seems to have a pretty complete list of all the titles. And I figured we would just go down them one by one and say, if anything here interests us. Okay. So I'm just I'm just gonna start throwing out names and you give me like a quick um this is what I think of it. Um Wakanda Forever Amazing Spider-Man. Okay, who's writing that? Let's see here. I want something that's not written by uh Coates on Black Panther, so I'll probably pick that up at least one issue just to see. Um I mean, I'm not as hot on Black Panther as everyone else is right now. I thought the movie was just okay. Well, but... that's because you're racist. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, um, I mean, I'm not reading any Spider-Man books right now, and this this is kind of this is kind of like a two birds and one stone thing. So I'll give this a shot. Okay. Um, for uh, the latest in the Jason Aaron um, saga. 
number one. You interested in this? I only read the first volume of Aaron's Thor, and I did like it, but it's a saga, as you said, so I'm probably not going to be reading that. I'll yeah. probably wait till like we get some really big trades of that. I'm gonna I'm gonna wait until they they give it like the treatment that Walt Simonson's run got, where where you can get like just a tome of everything. Mm -hmm. Um, Tony Stark Iron Man. Uh, this is Dan Slott on Iron Man. Does does this interest you at all? I'm not like a huge Dan Slott fan. Um, like he doesn't really do anything for me, and. Like outside of Silver Surfer, which I don't know how much credit to give to Mike Allred, so eh, we'll see. You know, that's just kind of what I got is is a we'll see mode right now. I mean, I'm super back and forth on Dan Slot. Sometimes I love him, sometimes I can't stand him. Um, but I did recently just read his Silver Surfer run, and that inspired a lot of goodwill in me. So I'll at least give this a shot. Mm -hmm. Um. Immortal Hulk by Al U Ewing, I believe that's how you pronounce that. Uh no, no, probably not. No. Yeah, I I just I don't care. Sorry, mm -hmm. I, I've never been a big Hulk guy. Um, I I enjoy him in the movies, but uh, never really found a reason to get big into him in comics. Yeah. Um, Deadpool by Scotty Young. Nah. I'll give it a shot because Deadpool comics are always at least kind of funny. Um, Ant-Man and the Wasp by Mark Wade. This is the first of a five-issue mini. I'm pretty hyped for this. How about you? You know, I've never been into Ant-Man or anything, but I do really like me some Mark Wade. And if it's only five issues, I probably I might not get that in single, but that'd be a cool trade to talk about at some point. Yeah, I mean... Um, I was super into the Nick Spencer Astonishing Ant-Man. I know people kind of want to burn that man at the stake now because of what he did to Captain America, but I swear to God, he was a competent writer at one point. Astonishing Ant-Man is really good. Um, and then I forget who wrote it, but the Unbelievable or no, the Unstoppable Wasp, um, which is the version of the Wasp that's going to be in this book, um, that's like the most underrated Marvel book in recent years. It's just a really cute, a adorable little teen superhero book. And uh, I would highly recommend it. And this is going to be the first time this version of Ant-Man and this version of the Wasp have met. So I'm pretty psyched for it. And also it's Mark Wade. So there's no way it can't be at least kind of good. Mm -hmm. Um. Multiple Man by Matthew Rosenberg. Um, this is also a five-issue mini. Do you care about this at all? No. I don't even um, know. Like, is, is Multiple Man a mu mutant? or Multiple Man is a is an X-Men? I know he's a mutant. I don't... I know he's from an X-Men team, but I don't know which one. <laughs> Literally all I know about him is that his power is he multiplies and he's a mutant. Yeah. I think um, I'm good on that one. I'm I'm kind of interested just because the covers look pretty neat, but uh, it'll really depend on what my budget is the week this comes out, if if I buy the first issue or not. Um, another uh, mini, this is six issues of Deadpool Assassin by Colin Bunn. Do uh, you care about this at all? See, I'm not a huge Deadpool comics guy, and Colin Bunn just doesn't quite do it for me. See, Colin Bunn's the guy who did the Deadpool Kilogy, and that's like one of my favorite things. Like I'm I I I'm kind of as into that as Cap is. So I I really want to give this a look. I really want to know what else Colin Bunn has to say on Deadpool, because it feels like he said everything there is to say about Deadpool at this point. So I'm a, I'm at least gonna give this a shot. All right. If he's got a strong voice for the character, that sounds cool. Uh, Marvel Rising Alpha by Devin Grayson. Um, I'm not sure if this is actually set in the Marvel Universe or if this is just a prequel to that new cartoon they're doing. Yeah, this kind of looks like the art style looks very different. Um, that's probably its own thing. I mean, I'm kind of interested in this cartoon, so... 
maybe this will be good, but not 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 really something I'm like, oh yeah, I gotta make sure I get that. Mm-hmm. Um, the Century by Jeff Jeff Lemire. Okay, I really like Jeff Lemire, but why the fuck are they bringing back the Century? Uh, because Marvel's kind of obsessed with going, but we have the DC characters too. For some reason, um, <laughs> but I, I don't care. I, I just don't care about the Century or whatever their discount store Batman is who's poked around before. Um, I don't care about any of their discount store DC characters. I just don't. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I don't know. I just remember people celebrating when Thor killed the Sentry, and I'm just like, yeah, okay. <laughs> if that's the way your fans reacted, maybe don't bring that character back, but whatever. <laughs> Um, Doctor Strange by Mark Wade. Uh, are you interested in this? Mark Wade is everywhere right he now. He is. He is. He is just the guy at Marvel right now. Um, you know, I can, I could see that. That could be a cool book. I might give that a shot. Yeah, I'm. I'm definitely kind of interested in that. Uh, a uh, bunch of Infinity Countdown and Hunt for Wolverine stuff I don't care about. Um, I don't think there's any more number ones on this list. So I'm going to go ahead and close this and get our next story real quick. Sure thing. Uh, da, da, da. Um, Nathan so, Steiner says, Doctor Strange on Wade. Neat. <laughs> I think you need to strike that and reverse it, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> um so as mentioned hunt for wolverine is going on right now um and of course wolverine's gonna come back from the dead and be and be a character again because nobody stays dying comedy blah 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 blah. um there's gonna be a new x23 series um are you interested in this at all see you know i'm just so not a marvel guy that's just oh. kind of my thing. I am just... It's not that I hate Marvel or anything. I just don't care about a lot of the universe and, and characters that much. They're just... i am always been more DC heavy. Um, so some of this stuff sounds really cool, but I'm just like, eh, I don't know. I don't really know anything about X-23, and Marvel's really bad about continuity being heavy, but at the same time, they are doing the whole fresh start. Maybe this would be a Now's good time, a good time, to time on if it. you're gonna. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. But I mean, like... I, th- I, think, I, I think of myself as a DC guy traditionally, but every time I hear about the history of the Marvel Universe, I'm always like, oh, that sounds interesting. I hope that character eventually has a good current run I can jump into. So... And I mean, I read the first few issues of All New Wolverine, which was the issue, was the series that w- has been going on where X-23 was Wolverine while Wolverine was dead. Um, but, and, and, and that was pretty okay. So I'm interested in this, but it's it's not like something I'm hyped over. Yeah. Um, I'll tell you what I'll probably do is if people... After this video is posted, if there's any of these Marvel titles that like you really, really want to hear me talk about, leave a comment because I don't know. I'm kind of I'm willing to try anything once most of the time, uh, not Scott Snyder's yeah. Justice League. But if if someone wants like really <laughs> wants to hear me talk about a book, go ahead and leave it in the comments. I'll give it a shot. Um, so we have two more stories, and they're both Marvel because I, I separated out Marvel and DC. Um. So there's going to be a new Dazzler solo book. Who's Dazzler? Dazzler is an X-Men from, I believe, the 80s, who was a teen pop sensation in the Marvel Universe and also a mutant. And uh, now that I think... Wait, this... Oh, this is a one-shot. Okay. Um, And it's basically Dazzler as an aging punk rocker. And that kind of sounds like like one of those weirdly awesome concepts that mm. I, I just I have to know. I have to know with this. It's a one-shot. says she is a mutant pop star and she can control light beams. 
it's a one shot. I could see picking that up. I'll I'll probably grab that just if I remember by the time it comes out. You know. I mean, if nothing else, it's got a really distinct kind of cool looking cover. Mm -hmm. Um. And last but not least, I saved the best bit of news of the month for the last, as Marvel themselves did. Ladies and gentlemen, after what? Three long years, we are finally getting a new Fantastic Four ongoing. <laughs> I am so excited. Um, and it's going to be Dan Slott, who, as I mentioned earlier, did an amazing Silver Surfer run. So I have no worries about this at all. Um, like, I'm, I'm legit there day one with this book. Yeah, it definitely sounds interesting. The Fantastic Four have been treated pretty shit by Marvel the last couple of years, so I could I could see getting excited for this. Again, Dan Slott, I really don't know about. I'm going to have to read something from him post-Silver Surfer because, again, I don't know how much credit to give to Mike Allred. Um, but, man, Fantastic Four would seem like the book to jump in with because Slott had a lot of passion for the whole space exploration doctor who kind of throwback with um silver surfer and it seems like you can do a lot of the same thing with fantastic four if it's hopefully in a similar uh wheelhouse to that so if anything that is the one i'm going to remember to pick up myself out of curiosity yeah um just stupidly hyped for that book like as far as fresh start goes it's that and uh Mark Wade on Ant-Man and the Wasp. Those are the two books that I'm like, I am definitely getting these. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't know. Maybe look forward to those being my my picks on the next show. Or I think Fantastic Four is a couple months out. Uh, but uh, Ant-Man and the Wasp should be either this month or next month. Nice, nice. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, if that's it for all the news. I think that will do it for the first new episode of the monthly comic roundup for March 2018. Uh, hopefully, we make it at least three months this time. <laughs> oh, man. All right, Vac, thanks a lot for doing this with me. This is a lot of fun, man. Uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, and uh, I, I, I do definitely hope we'll make it more than three months. I'm going to make it my goal to at least get to the end of the year. Yep, yep, that's, that's a good goal. I like that goal. Let's, let's, it's, it's a realistic goal. All right. Everyone, thanks very much for watching. Until next time. Bye. Later.